Welcome to Let's Chat with Derek. I am your host, Derek Fage, and he is a familiar face, a familiar voice. And if you love sports writing, he is probably familiar to you as well. If you're a subscriber to The Athletic, I am joined by senior writer at The Athletic, Ian Mendez. Ian, how you doing? Derek, great to be back. I got to tell you, being back on uh, Rogers TV is really cool. Like it's, uh, this is really cool for me. And, uh, I, but I do feel old when you say things like senior, senior writer for the athletic. That just makes me feel old. <laughs> it has nothing to do with age. It just, you know, it's just where you are in the hierarchy. That's yeah. what it means. <laughs> yeah. You're not one of those junior writers. You're, you're a senior writer, but you mentioned Rogers and that really let's, let's go back to those days because that really began. I mean, you started as a PR manager, you went into television reporting, radio host, and now you're a writer. But tell me about some of your beginnings, Ian. Yeah, and listen, if I would not be sitting in this chair uh, being interviewed by you uh, if it was not for Rogers TV. Really, I wouldn't. I, I mean, I did the, the, uh, the journalism program at Carleton, I uh, did a four-year program there, and my dream was to get into sports, right? But when you get right out of uh, journalism school, there's not a whole bunch of jobs just waiting for you, right? They're not uh, big news outlets, and, and they're not lining up for you. you got to start to pound the pavement and kind of get noticed. And if it wasn't for Rogers TV, I wouldn't have got noticed. And, you know, the, the funny thing, Derek, I always – I tell this story because now I, I get a chance to uh, teach a little journalism on the side or I go back in to schools and talk to them on career day, and everyone always asks – how did you get your big break? What was your big break? It was me doing, in the summer of 2001, Derek, I did a broadcast of an Ottawa Lynx, Syrac and I think they were playing Syracuse, who used to be the Blue Jays' old AAA affiliate, and I'm doing the game with Mark Sutcliffe, who is one of the best broadcasters uh, in this city, uh, criminally yeah. underrated. Mark Mark's one of those guys that I feel like if he was on the Nationals, like had a bigger platform, uh, national stage, he'd He'd be, he's that good. Yeah, that's what I think oh, of Mark yeah. Sutcliffe as a, as a broadcaster, as an interviewer. And so Mark and I are doing the game, uh, the Ottawa Lynx and Syracuse, and this is summer of 2001. And unbeknownst to me, I ended up being on the radar of Sportsnet from that game. And I'll tell you how it happened was later that year in 2001, I, I was working for the Ottawa Senators PR department, and I get a phone call. And I'm in the senator's office, okay? And so I see the number comes up, and it's Sportsnet. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, they got an interview request. They want to do a double-ender with Daniel Alfredson. They want to, you know, because I see that it's a Sportsnet number. So I pick it up, and uh, it's Jerry Dobson, who, uh, you know, people might remember. Jerry was uh, the soccer guy for Sportsnet, but he also served as, like, their, their lead editorial guy. And he's like, hey, Ian, it's Jerry Dobson from Sportsnet. Um, just phoning to see if you have any interest in in a television career. And I'm thinking, what, why or how is Jerry <laughs> Dobson, how does he know this about me? And he says, look, this past summer, I happened to be flipping around my TV. I guess he uh, had the, the Mississauga Rogers. Uh, he lived in Mississauga, had Rogers TV. It was flipping my channel, and it stopped, and you were on my screen doing a little intro for the, the Lynx game. And I guess they broadcast this one particular game into the GTA because it was the, the Blue Jays uh, AAA affiliate. And just so happened that Jerry Dobson stopped me. He said, look, I, you know, I, I saw what you did there. I knew, I know of you because you're the Senators PR guy. I thought, you know, we're opening up. He says to me, uh, you know, we're, we're basically Rogers is going to be buying Sportsnet and we're taking it over from CTV. And in every bureau, we're opening up a spot. And we'd like to to think about you potentially being that guy if you're interested. So send me a demo reel, and I, I like that's how I got my break. And it, that if it is wasn't incredible. Rogers TV, I wouldn't have had my big break. I mean, what are the chances? It's absolutely, I, I absolutely love that story. I've you've I've heard you tell that story a couple of times, and it, it, it's really incredible. And it just shows how Rogers has been such a great stepping stone for, for so many people. I think people forget that about community television, how it's, how it's such an incredible stepping stone. And then along the, along the line, along the way, um, you made the transition into, into radio. Tell me how that transition began. You know, into radio, um, similar story in that, like, you know, it's funny, like I, I've had three pretty good jobs here. Okay. I've worked for Sportsnet worked for TSN 1200 and I've worked for, uh, and I work for The Athletic. And in none of these jobs, 
a were they ever posted like on a you know like a monster.com or linkedin or you know these places that you find jobs and i've never this is what's really funny too is i i, I think about this i have never sent my resume into any of these places isn't that weird like it's amazing uh, like i could have made this all i could have made the whole thing up maybe maybe i anyway like nobody's ever <laughs> asked me for a resume <laughs> it's funny but the, the the radio station job basically came about because i you know after i had you know jumped on at sportsnet and i loved it there like i hope people understand how much i love working for rogers how much i love working for sportsnet it was amazing got to come to the world series and the stanley cup and all the things that you you know you think about when you're a kid and you want to do all these things well i did all of them and then it become became a real grind for me i think um just i don't think what people appreciate is the 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 kind of the toll it takes on your family life. And if, if you want to be a parent and a sports reporter, it's a hard thing to do. It really is. It's yeah. a hard, I think it's, it's tough being a parent and any, uh, having any type of full-time job, uh, but, but doing it in a job that's so demanding of your, your evenings and weekends and your travel, it, you know, it gets to the point where you would, you would have a, uh, you know, you'd find out, Hey, my, my child has a, a recital at school next Thursday at, you know, 6 p.m. You're like, okay, well, senators don't play a game six, then I can make it. And like, you know what? It gets to no, a point. it's true. So, yeah. 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 And and so, you know, I got to a point where I just said to myself, you know, if there's ever an opportunity that comes up and there's a um, there's an opening with, with radio or something else, I'll do it. And it just so happened in, in 2013, at the end of the summer, I got a text from someone who worked at uh, – 1200 TSN 1200 saying, Hey, uh, Dave gross has just left TSN 1200 and we might need somebody. I know you mentioned in the past, you're interested. Are you serious or not? I'm like hundred percent. I'm serious. And so I met uh, John Rodenberg, who's the, um, station manager and, uh, just one of the best people I've ever worked for. I, I would honestly, Derek, and I, I, I don't know how many people, um, kind of understand that the John Rodenberg not only hosts the morning show, but he's the, He's the program director. He's the guy that yeah. makes a lot of the key decisions there. I would run through a wall for that man. Like literally run through a wall. I have wow. so much time and respect for John Rodenberg. I, I just hope the world knows what a type of human being he is. So when he sat down with me and uh, we, we met at the Chapters Indigo, there's a little patio at a Starbucks, you know, by Pinecrest with the Ikea. Yeah, yeah, I know the there. exact place. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we sat down for a little, uh, basically a, uh, a coffee date and he was like are you, are you serious you would leave a network tv job to join us and i he was almost like are you i think he was trying to feel me out to see like is this guy real or not real or is he trying to keep his tv job and move into radio i'm like jr i'm ready to move i just i'm exhausted ready for the change and it ended up being a seven-year run there that i i wouldn't change anything i wouldn't trade it for the world love my time at 1200 love the guys at 1200 yeah. everything i just you know what reached a point where i had to make a change and i was glad uh, i glad i uh, i made that change yeah i want to continue talking a little bit about radio because before you 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 took on this this new i mean uh, i love your writing and and we'll get to that if if you're a sports fan especially an ottawa senator sports fan and you and you love a little humor added to your sports as well as all the analytics uh, Ian is, is such a great writer, but, you know, you were still doing radio, you know, we're living in this global pandemic and you were still doing radio at that time. And I want to talk about what it was like, you know, trying to cover sports on a, on a radio station for what th a three hour show, four hour show. And there's no sports going on. I mean, what was that like for you guys, Ian? You know what? And and I think when my uh, when my career is all said and done, I'm going to look back at the eight months of 2020 from about, you know, end of March to December, which ended up being my last eight months on, on radio. I'm going to look back and I think that's the eight months I'm most proud of. And it's because we were able to take some chances. We were able to take some risks. And, I, you know, I had a four hour talk show, Derek, every day. And I can I, I will say this to you without any. Um, there's no hyperbole here. There's no exaggeration. There wasn't one day where I went into that station and I said, uh-oh, what are we going to talk about? It was the weirdest thing. Uh, I was able to find out, um, you know, as much, 
you know, about myself and we pushed the envelope and we did some weird things. We did some fun things. We did themes, we did trivia, we did uh, movie themed and, 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 you know, and here's the, I'll give you a great example of my favorite show during the pandemic was we were, we were talking about sports movies and there's a great movie from probably when you and I were kids, you know, in that neighborhood. Uh, and it was called, oh my God, a rookie of the year. Okay. So rookie okay. of the year is this great baseball movie where this 12 year old kid has a freak accident with his arm and all of a sudden he can throw a hundred miles an hour. Now he's the star pitcher for Chicago <laughs> Cubs. But in the opening scene of this movie, this 12 year old kid is playing baseball on his little league team and he's wearing jeans. So think about it. When you play baseball as a kid, you've got a full uniform, but this kid's wearing blue jeans. And I right. brought this up on the radio and I said, what the <laughs> heck is this? Why is this guy wearing jeans? And then the sub question was, have you ever played sports wearing like wearing the wrong equipment or wearing the wrong stuff. Derek, <laughs> the inbox flooded up. People with great <laughs> stories of, I had to play softball in dress pants because I forgot my my stuff and and like uh, just amazing stories. People talking about, uh, one guy said, I play, I play goalie in a men's league and I always wear jeans. And I'm like, what? That's so weird, right? Like, imagine doing that. Yeah. It touched off this wonderful conversation of weird times where you had to play sports not wearing the ideal, uh, you know, garments or whatever. And it was just fun. And I think that kind of encapsulated the pandemic for me is that we, we tried to become a distraction for people uh, to not think about, you know, lockdowns and, and different color codes and uh, and, it, and it was, it was really rewarding. It was challenging, but it was super rewarding. Yeah, and it allowed you to talk about some really serious subjects as well. I mean, you faced it in your career, Ian. You know, you faced your share of, of racism and, and, you know, racist comments on, on social media. And, you know, you guys were able to, to really tackle Black Lives Matter. And, and I know that was something that, you know, I, I mean, I listened to you and I, you know, I continue continue to listen to the guys but that that was something that uh, was really important not only to yourself but I, I think to the station and and you guys uh, really tackled that incredibly well that must be something you you're proud of as well yeah and you know and I I, um, I I put a lot of thought you know I think that's the only time in my seven years in radio the only time in which I went on the air and I read something that was prepared I had never done that before, never done anything like that since, but I wrote it out uh, in advance because I thought, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I really want to say something of substance and I want it to have the right tone and I want to read it with the right emphasis and I, I don't want to do it off the cuff. This is too serious of an issue to wing it. So I sat down, you know, that, that day, day, day before I put all my thoughts down and you know, you know what's funny is I was like, oh, I'll be okay, but I'll, I'll read it in front of my my wife and kids before I uh, before I go on the air. And I actually started crying. Okay. I'm like, my God, good thing I did this. Wow. Good thing I did. <laughs> my kids were shocked. I think they were like, I don't think I've seen my dad really cry. And and I got choked up. And I thought, wow, this is actually hitting me deeper than I thought. And it's only until I actually spoke the words out loud that it really resonated with me. Uh, and, and, you know, to, the ability to use sports as a canvas and a platform is something that's important to me. You know, Derek, I don't want to be remembered as the guy uh, at the end of the day that people are like, oh, yeah, you know, when, when, when the Senator's power play is struggling, that's who I want to hear from. I want people to say, I want to hear from that guy when there's like a kind of a, a social issue that intersects with sports or a political issue that intersects with sports. And... I think that George Floyd, because the world was on pause, remember that was right at the kind of the height of the world's lockdown. We had no choice yeah. but to face that head on. There was there was nothing else going on. There was no games. There was no, uh, even the sports world couldn't couldn't ignore it. And yeah. I think it was, a, it was a great opportunity for a reset. I think at the end of the day, I think we accomplished more uh, with Black Lives Matter and racism in sports in the in the period of time without sports going on, I think we accomplished more on that front than we ever would have if there were games going on. 
Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I, I just, I'll, I'll reiterate the fact that I was so impressed with you guys. I, I listen to you guys all the time. I'm a huge sports fan, as you know. And, you know, without sports going on, I, I was still glued to the radio listening to you guys because the content that you came up with, uh, you know, on we just talked about the serious side, but you also mentioned, you know, how much fun you guys had. And it, 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 it was a great connection to the community. There's no doubt, especially during during that kind of difficult time. Let's then fast forward. And now you've decided uh, another career change, a senior writer with The Athletic. It, it seemed like something deeper than, you know, just, oh, you know what, I, I, I don't know where radio's going. It, was this another family type of decision? Why this decision to move to, to The Athletic? Yeah, this one was more of a, a selfish decision. I'm not going to lie to you. This one, I felt like I was going to put my career back on the on the front burner. And you know, I really appreciate the seven years at, at 1200. And I wondered though, last couple of years, I wondered, was I, was I stagnating a little bit? Was I getting complacent? Was I getting to the point where it wasn't challenging? It was always fun, but I was worried a little bit in the back of my head, am I not being challenged enough every day? And that's, that's never where you want to get to. And I, I don't think it, it matters yeah. what your line of work is. If you work in the, in the government or you work uh, private sector, if you ever feel like after a you know six eight month period you're like i'm not really being challenged depending on the type of person you are some people like that some people like the fact that they've mastered something and they want to keep doing it i, I got all the respect in the world for people who want to do that that uh, that approach too but i just kind of felt like there was this one thing nagging me which is i always wondered look i i was able to tell myself i could do tv and, and just like you you know when you got an opportunity to, to do uh, you know, breakfast television in Montreal, there's probably a little thing in the back of your mind, like, I wonder if I can do this. And then when you go yeah. and you do it, you're like, okay, now I know I can do it. And it's a great thing. <laughs> it's true. You check it off your, you, yeah. you know, and you don't have to wonder, you know, that's, that's the one thing. When I look at your career, you don't have to wonder, could I have made it on a bigger stage? Cause you did. And it, and it, it it's a good feeling. Right. And so for me, the yeah. one thing left on the, on the box was, could I be a writer? Cause I felt like I did TV and it was fun. I did radio. And I think, I don't, I don't think I was like, I, I did, I hit my peak in radio, which is not okay. to say that I, I am the best radio person. Ever. I just hit my peak <laughs> and I knew I wasn't going to get better uh, at it. And uh, I don't think I scratched the surface as a writer yet. I got to do writing with Sportsnet. I got to do writing with TSN and I'll be eternally grateful because if I didn't have those opportunities with Sportsnet and TSN to write, I don't think the athletic would have come calling. I, I think they would have been like, oh, that guy's a radio guy. That guy's a TV guy. That guy doesn't know how to write. But instead, they identified me and they're like, you know, I think this guy, this guy could be a good fit. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it was a perfect, the timing was perfect. The, my kids are old enough that I feel like, okay, I can change up my uh, workflow a little bit. And if I have to take the odd trip, I'll take the odd trip. And if I have to work weekends again, I'll work weekends a little bit, uh, the odd time. So the timing was perfect. And it, uh, it has been a great, or it was a great uh, first season for me. Well, yeah, let's talk about, uh, you mentioned first season. Let's talk about the, the Senators season because, you know, it, it started out so poorly. And I mean, so many fans were disappointed. I mean, I think there were fans that were thrown in the towel you know, the goaltending was an absolute disaster. And then sort of after the trade deadline, this this team sort of started to come together. They, they got rid of some of the veterans that many fans were disappointed that they were playing. Your thoughts on, on the season and, and can they carry over some of this momentum? Because many people think, oh, well, these games didn't really matter. You know, that's why they had this kind of success. Or, or should we be excited as a fan base? Oh, I think I think Sens fans should be excited, and and I think if you would have told me whatever their record was, now I'm blank, and I think it was one one eight and one. They won one of their first ten games, right, or two of their first fourteen, yeah. whatever it was. If you would have told me at that point that the season would end and Ottawa would be arguably the hottest Canadian team, plus hockey, <laughs> and little kids would be throwing hats at Tim Stutzla in their backyard, and like people would love the Senators. I'd be like, what, what happened? What are you talking about? This is the worst team in the league. And something <laughs> happened in, in the middle of March, uh, better goaltending, uh, little, you know, little younger lineup, 
whatever you want to attribute it to, it, it was the perfect storm. And I think there's really reason for optimism because Derek, I think the key was the guys who were doing it in March and April and into the first week of May were the guys that are the young guys that are part of the equation. It was Drake Batherson and, and Norris and Kachuk and Stutzla had that hat trick and uh, Connor Brown's going to be a big part of this team and Nick Paul. It wasn't like the guys that were doing it were like these older veterans that you're like, nah, I, I don't know. Like this is, it never felt like garbage time to me. You know, you know what I mean? Right. Like when you're, when you're, when you're dealing with young kids trying to break in, there is no such thing as meaningless. There's no such thing as meaningless games. There's no garbage time. It all means something. So if they can get some good goaltending, like if they just give us some average goaltending, I'm not even asking for out, <laughs> out of this world. Can we start with average goaltending? I think they might have a puncher's chance to uh, to make the playoffs next year. And I don't know what you think because, I, I mean, they're probably going to go back to that old division. You're like, oh, man, Toronto, Boston, Tampa. There's three spots. Yeah. Florida is pretty good. Maybe that's the extra spot. Um, you know, I, I don't know what you think, but – I just think in my heart of hearts, I feel like they're going to be better than Montreal. They're going to be, and that, that means something around here. I think they're going to be better than Buffalo. I think they're going to be better than Detroit. It's just a question of, can they get into that, that next sphere? But there's some optimism and Ottawa fans deserve that. After the, the, the three year run here, uh, you Ottawa fans deserve every piece of good news and optimism coming your way. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And uh, I, I think they have a chance at the playoffs. I'm not going to guarantee they're going to get into the playoffs, but uh, I have a lot of optimism as well. It's And there's something, it seems, Ian, and I know every team can say this and fan base can say this, but I just see it seems to be with all the young guys. There is this incredible connection of, especially when you look at Kachuk, Norris, and Stutz you know, living together, and you mentioned the hat-throwing incident. But just the way that they communicate on the ice and how much fun they're having, you can include all the other young guys as well. It just seems like the chemistry here is is really going towards something quite special. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what's really cool, right? Like like you mentioned, Thomas Shabbat is even living with, uh, had Jacob Bernard Docker living with him. Timmy Stutzla was living with, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kachuk and, and Norris. Uh, I think Colin White had Shane Pinto living with him. It just felt like in a year in which the pandemic really put up some barriers, there was a closeness to this group. And that's a cool thing. Like the last three years, so ever since they went to that infamous run against Pittsburgh, it's been a real kind of mishmash feel, right? Like the first year yeah. they still kind of had Carlson and Stone and some of the guys, and then that blew up. The year after that, Stone and Pajot and Duchesne were around, and then they got traded. And then even last year, you know, there was some, I don't know, it felt like yeah, Ron Hainsey is here. Like, what, what's he doing here? And, uh, like, <laughs> yeah. it just it never quite felt like the kids had control of the team until this year. And now it feels like if you ask me who's the leader of that team, my answer is Brady Kachuk. And I don't think yeah. he was the leader. When Stone was here, he couldn't be the leader. When Pajot was here, he couldn't be the leader. He's the leader of this team. And and and, and it's it feels good for Ottawa fans to look at this and say everyone's in their early 20s. It's a super fun team. And can you imagine, Derek, if at the end of the season um, we had been allowed to have fans back in the arena? The amount of love for this group of young kids I think would have been reflected in some, some exciting games at home, some games with atmosphere. And I don't know what October is going to look like or November, and maybe we'll have – 3,000 fans in the building or 5,000 fans. That that feels like a realistic uh, target. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel good. At least to start the year, there's going to be a lot of optimism. And when the fans get back into the building, I think they're going to shower the Kachucks and the Bathersons and the Shabbats and all that with, uh, with a lot of love. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, you, you know, I you, you mentioned Kachuk and, and you know, uh, what an amazing leader he's been. And Shabbat's a great leader as well, but I think Kachuk just – has that sense, um, especially among the fan base, that he is the true leader of this team, which brings me to the comments that Melnick made on this bridge contract that, you know, people have been discussing. Is he going to go with the bridge contract and kind of, you know, bet on, on himself or, or is he going to sign long term? And then Melnick comes out with the, well, we're not going to give the captaincy to somebody on a bridge contract a really strange comment to make and to hold something over a player like Kachuk, who's a very passionate guy. And from a hockey family, I imagine that 
the Kachuk family probably didn't take those comments very well. No, and you know, it's it's it was disappointing a little bit. That that entire interview was a little bit disappointing because you felt like there was this tremendous feeling of optimism around the team. And then the owner speaks on the Bob McCowan podcast and not only says, hey, Brady Kachuk's not going to be the contract on a bridge, uh, captain on a bridge contract. But uh, speaking of bridges, we're going to move over the bridge and play games in Gatineau. And you're like, wait, what? Like, who that are you talking insane. about? Yeah, it is. So it, it was disappointing. And just, you know, back to the Kachuk thing. Uh, I think you can be a captain on a bridge deal. I, I do. I really do. I don't like Absolutely. what I, yeah, what I don't love is the idea that the captaincy would be a, a negotiating tool in contract talks. I don't think that's what the captaincy is for. The captaincy is for identifying the heartbeat and the leader of your team. And if that guy signs a three-year deal because that's what's best for him right now, you can't hold that against him and say, you're not committed to this. Like, what do you want him to sign for eight years and take less money just to wear the seat? It doesn't work that way. But I'll say this. If you sign Brady Kachuk to a three-year deal and it's a, a, like a fair deal, like $6 million or $7 million per year, you sign him for three years and you name him your captain, it's going to be awfully hard for him to walk away in three years because he knows he's built it. It's very – you don't often see captains who have been captains for a long time, especially in their early years, they're given the, the captaincy. They're very reluctant to leave. That means a lot. Why not, why not work it – like reverse engineer this thing? and give him the captaincy and work backwards rather than making him earn the captaincy through some kind of faulty idea that uh, that loyalty is is part of the equation here. Ian, just under a minute left, and I, I want to give you an opportunity for people to subscribe to The Athletic because, as I said, uh, I, I was actually been a subscriber since before you went over, and you certainly solidified the fact I'm going to remain a subscriber, but uh, easy to subscribe and, and so much content. I mean, it's not just Ottawa Senators content. There, there's a tons of sports content available. Yeah, and I appreciate the uh, the platform for that, Derek, because it, it's fun, but it's it's a unique way of doing it. And I think people aren't used to paying for sports content on their phones that is just, you know, print stories or uh, things of that nature. But for us, it's important that we provide unique content, stuff you won't find anywhere else. You're not going to get those videos that pop up in the middle of a story. And, that, you know, so we're mindful of it. We know that you're paying for journalism. And when you pay for journalism, you should demand better journalism. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to do unique things, uh, fun things. And, you know, it's, you know, a couple of bucks a month. And, you know, hopefully I, I'm, it sounds like you're, you're finding it worth your while. And uh, we appreciate you subscribing, but it's, uh, it's, it's a great platform. And I think it's great to be part of a roster of such, such talented writers uh, all over the place. Excellent. Uh, Ian, thank you so much for doing this. I, I, I really appreciate your time. I should share with viewers, we had some technical difficulties. This is our like third time doing this. So I am so happy to finally get this done. Really appreciate it. And uh, all the best to, to you and your family. Stay safe and, and stay healthy, Ian. Yeah, same to you. And uh, listen, love to do this again down the road with you, Derek. Absolutely. Take care. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. You've been watching another episode of Let's Chat with Derek. Oh,